Jesus. You got to have fun. This is Enjoy Church, right? Right on. Well, we're in this series called Relationship. Last week, Keisha brought you a word on ministering to our community. She did a fabulous job, didn't she? That was a good word. And so anyway, today we're going to talk about relationship. Now, I'm going to talk about love. And most people don't get excited when you talk about love. In fact, uh, a friend of mine wrote a book on love and said that couldn't even sell the book, so she had to give the book away because love, oh, I'll I'll skip that service. But let me just tell you something about love. Love is the most powerful part of our lives because without love, we really don't have anything. In fact, it was in 1 Corinthians where Paul said in chapter 13, You can raise the dead. You can heal the sick. You can work miracles. You can do all these things. But if you don't have love, he just basically, if he was living in today's culture, he would say, you don't have jack. (laughs) He just said, you don't have anything if you don't have love. And love can be very difficult. Also, Everything that we go through in life, in this fallen work, a broken world that we live in, everything is a test and a challenge. And it's easy to love when the feelings are there, but when the feelings aren't there, that's when real love shows up. And I always say it this way too, because as believers, we're constantly being tested in our faith. The value of something comes through the test of it. Young people who are dating, they're always in love and they don't need the premarital counseling that we take them through because I know everybody else needs it. But we don't need it because we truly are in love. And always, inevitably, within six months, they're back in the office. Can I get an appointment with you or Pastor Ryan? Uh, we want to talk. This is much more difficult than we thought. Yes, but living life is that way too. So whether it's your faith walk with Christ, whether it is your giving and your generosity, we're being tested right now with our faith because of inflation and gas prices. And what happens is people want to quit and want to back off. Oh, it's hard. Well, yeah, it's hard. Life gets hard at times. Life gets hard. When the, when the doctor gives you a bad report or there's a, a feeling of pain in the body, a lot of times we back off from our covenant. I'm getting right into the preaching today. We back off of our covenant, the covenant that God says, by his stripes I was healed. And as believers, the test doesn't come when you're feeling great. And that's not when victory comes. Victory comes when the pain sets in. Victory comes when the relationship is stressed. Victory comes when I continue to be generous. I'm continuing to be a tither. I'm continuing to give. When inflation is going nuts and when the paycheck is shrinking, that's when I'm an overcomer. Is when I plant and I say, I am in this and I am not quitting. I'm not going anywhere. I used to say this in the early days of ministry, whenever I first started preaching and I would go to church and I remember in those very early days thinking to myself, I know what I'll be doing 40 years from now. And I used to say it, I know what I'll be doing. I'll be doing the same thing. And then you go through life and you're tested You're tested on the left and you're tested on the right. Somewhere you've got to make your mind up. I am here, baby, to stay. And one of the ways that you defeat the devil in your life, the devil will always challenge you, challenge you to get you to try to get you to quit, challenge you to not believe, challenge you to question God. And one of the things that you and I can do is just plant our feet and go, I don't care. You may cry through this, okay? I don't care what it feels like. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care. 
I will do the right thing that I've committed to do. So what I'm going to share with you about love, this works for marriages, husband and wives. This works for friendships. This works for parents with children. So you can apply this to whatever situation you're in need of. You'll be able to apply this word to it. So single people, you're going to be able to apply this word. Married people, you're going to be able to apply this word. People with friends, you're going to be able to apply this word. This word will make sense to you. First John, first scripture here is chapter four, verse seven. The scripture says, let's love one another for love comes from God. Love comes from God. Whoever does not love doesn't know God because God is love. God doesn't have love. God doesn't just do love. God is love. And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must, circle the word must, must love his brother. So I tried to get you a little bit hooked with this title. I think you think that the, we've got a big crowd today because of the baptism. I think it was my title of my sermon. <laughs> the title of the sermon is Make Love. I knew that'd get people in church. I just knew if you saw a title, Make Love. Oh, we're going to church, baby. Sweetheart, get dressed. We're going to church. And then, and then the last part of the title is last. Make love last. <laughs> eat love. Eat love? Okay. There's, there's a book at the bookstore called Eat Last. And I thought, make love last. All right. So you can take this however it needs to be taken at your house. All right. Amen. Let me give you, if we're going to talk about love, we've got to talk about the misconceptions of love. First of all, love is not a feeling. One of the misconceptions, and I hear people say this, and I, I know that sometimes we say it and we really haven't thought that deep about it, but we think that love is a feeling. And let me just tell you, love can, can, love doesn't always, love can produce feelings. And I like it when the feelings are there. But love is not a feeling. That needs to be said a thousand times over. Because I've seen times where we break off relationship, whether it be a marriage, whether it be a, a, a friendship, a lot of times we break those off because we're not feeling the quiver in the liver and the buzz of what's going on. How many of you know the great, the feelings are great when they're there, but love is not a feeling. Nowhere in the scripture does it say love is an incredible feeling. Love is an incredible emotion. Oh, it can produce some of those. But how many of you know when life gets tough, the feelings aren't always there. And so I want to help you walk in love because I, I guess the greatest compliment that Christ gives his people is that you're known by your love for one another. Here's the other misconception about love. A lot of people feel like love is out of your control. Like, I can't help it. I just fell in love with him. I fell in love with her. As if love is uncontrollable. It's kind of like, I don't know, I was just walking down the street of life and I fell in the ditch of love. <laughs> I fell in love. Kind of like Elf. You know how he said, I love her and I don't care who knows it. <laughs> Love's not a feeling and love is not uncontrollable where you just couldn't help it. You just fell in love. I got to divorce that guy <laughs> because I fell in love with that person. This maybe is for the singles. This is just good old fashioned Bible common sense. Did you know that that a man and a woman, male and a female, who spend a ton of time together, 
one of the two, 99.9% of the time, one of the two will develop feelings for the other. Did you hear the two amens (laughs) from the front row? It's so true. Whoever you spend time with, it's easier to love until you spend a certain amount of time with them. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? It's like there's feelings that come from spending time together. And I'm I'm just saying to you, there's a lot of times where I've seen this. I've seen this a hundred times, especially in the church world where, you know, the Bible is very, very, very clear about being equally yoked. And what that means equally yoked is some people have taken that to mean he, he or she just needs to be a Christian. Check that box. But equally yoked means that you're going the same direction, that you're in unity, and you're walking the same degree. That's why in our values here at Joy Church, we talk about love as number one, love God and then love people. But then number two on the list is unity. There's something about being unified, walking the same direction, going the same direction. When we do that, our hearts are knit together And then the other values, it's easier for the other values to fall in place. The five that we've identified, that the scripture identifies for us, uh, easy to fall into place once we've identified that situation. And so I could go a hundred different directions today, but I want to stick with this. So what does God say that love is? Well, number one, God says love is a matter of our choice. In other words, you make a decision, you make a commitment, you decide, I choose to walk in love. Colossians chapter 3 verse 14 says, and over all virtues put on love which binds them all together. Well, if I put on love, I wouldn't I be a put on? Wouldn't I be a fake? Wouldn't I be a phony if I put on love because I don't feel love? I'm not having loving thoughts. No, put on means you walk in faith. You choose. I'm going to walk in love. I don't feel anything. I'm not going to tell you that, but I don't feel anything, but I'm going to put it on. I'm going to put love on like I put my jacket on, like I put my pants on. I'm putting it on. In other words, it is a choice that I choose to walk in love. So the first thing he says The Bible says about what love is, is love is a choice. It's a decision. It's a commitment. (laughs) You hear how excited everybody is like. (sighs) (laughs) Let me tell you what else the scripture says that love is. Love is a matter of conduct. Love is a matter of behavior. In other words, it's a matter of action when we conduct ourselves. First John chapter three, verse 18 says, let us not love only with words or our tongue. It's easy to talk the talk, but let us also love with action and truth, action and truth. So when you choose, number one, I'm choosing to walk in love. It's a choice. It's a decision. So I've chosen it. I'm going to do it. Now I have action coupled with it. Now I show my love by my behavior towards someone else. Doing nice things for them. It's conduct. It's action. It's what I do, not only what I say. I want to talk to you a little bit today about how to love someone you don't like. Don't point at him. (laughs) Some people are pointing at their husbands or their wives. How to love somebody you don't like. Listen, the liking and the feelings, they can come and go, and sometimes they do. Feelings are fickle, right? They'll come and go, and you feel all excited, and then other times you're like, how did I ever do that? How did I ever love you? Well, Let me just teach you a little bit today about how to love someone. The best, the first, and the most important way to love others is to, number one, it's in our mission statement here at Enjoy Church, and that is to experience God's love personally. 
We say it this way. We exist as a church, and Joy Church exists for this reason, to lead people. Come on, y'all, we're going somewhere. Come on, will you go with us? To lead people to experience and enjoy the unconditional love of Christ. Did you know that one of the best things you can ever experience in your life, the best thing you'll ever experience is understanding, because the devil's lying to you constantly about this, experiencing personally that God loves you. I want you to think about it from a big picture. And here's the big picture. Think about it this way. Scripture, all through the scripture to back this up. God created the universe, not because he was lonely. God wasn't lonely. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, heaven was full of all the angels. It wasn't that he was lonely. You know what it was? God wanted a family. God wanted a family. He created the universe and created the sun, created the stars, created the earth. Think about the earth. It's set on the perfect axis. It spins at just the right speed. It's flowing and going through through the universe right now at a high rate of speed. And think about this. One way this way, we freeze to death. One way that way, we burn, we burn up. It's just perfect. God created the universe so that he could create the sun, the moon, the stars, so that he could create the earth, so that he could create you to love you. God's not mad at you. He was upset with our sin, the original sin from Adam and then all of our sin. And he loved us so much. You've seen it before. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to die for you and I so that we would have life, so that we'd have eternal life, so that we'd have forgiveness of our sins, so that we would have a covenant with him, so that we would be brought into the family. That's what baptism is all about, the old dying and going down. And the symbolism, it's not just a symbol, though. It's the resurrection of life. And when we go down, some people think it's only symbolic, that baptism is only symbolic. It's a symbol, a public confession of my faith. And it is that. It is a public confession. But there is a spiritual faith action that takes place when you go down into those baptismal waters. The book of Colossians talks about this. What happens to us spiritually by faith is there's a cutting away of that fleshy part of me, that old flesh nature in my spirit that craves addiction and craves the, the things my flesh wants, you know, your flesh wants. And what happens when you go down by faith, there is a circumcision Colossians said, the apostle Paul said, a spiritual surgery happens on our heart where God removes that fleshiness from our spirit and our soul. And when you come up out of that water, it, those of you getting baptized today, I want you to believe God for this miracle to take place in your heart. That, that old nature that you struggle with, Paul talked about it in Romans chapter seven, where he said, I want to do the right thing. I end up doing the wrong thing. Can I get a witness? And then what happens is the part of it is part of the reason we struggle with that old nature. Is some of us haven't been baptized, number one. Number two, some of us, when we were baptized, we didn't know to put our faith toward this. And you need to get, you need to get baptized again. You only get need, need, need to get saved once. But you can get baptized as understanding comes. Go back down in that water again. That's why we always open it up every time we have a baptism service. Oh, the lights came on. I didn't do it that way. I just formally went down in the water. It's time to make it real. Come on back up. Let a revival. Where does revival begin? It begins with me. It begins in my heart. And it's an attitude of going, I'm going to be alive again. I'm going to wake up again. Amen. So you need to experience God's love. Ephesians, one of my favorite books, probably my favorite book in the Bible is the book of Ephesians. I love it because it talks about our identity in Christ. See, until you know who he has made you to be, 
you oftentimes feel like he's upset because you know yourself, you know your failures, you know your weaknesses, you know where you're insufficient. And we, out of that oftentimes becomes, uh, it shows up as insecurity and hurt and rejection. And when you find out who you are and who God says, I am who he says I am, we just sang that song. When you understand and you start realizing you are who he says you are, then your behavior begins to change. And you're not gritting good. Oh, I got to be good. I got to be good. That never worked for me. <laughs> it just didn't work for me. I was afraid of getting in trouble, you know, and so I tried to be good. It wasn't until I realized, and I am realizing, I'm still in that process, and so are you, of realizing who I am. The book of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, I pray, Paul is praying, I pray that Christ the anointed one and his anointing, that Christ will be more and more at home in your heart. I pray that for you. I speak that over you right now. May Christ Jesus, may he be more at home in your heart, more and more and more every day that you walk, every time you come into church, every time you go to your small group, every time you pray, every time you read the scripture, every time you confess the word over your life, May he, Christ, make himself more at home in your heart. Don't you want it to be where Holy Spirit is just, man, where he's just like, I'm at home here in Donovan and Jenny's heart. It's good to have you guys back with us today. I'm at home. And where wouldn't it be neat if God's having a conversation with some of the angels and he's saying, man, I have. I am so at home in Terry's heart. It's just like, this is home for me. This is home. Well, that's what he is saying about you. We just need to realize that, that he makes his home in your heart. Let me read the rest of that verse. Living within you as you trust him. The key to this, if you want Christ to make himself at home in your heart, is to develop your faith. Develop your trust. Pastor, that's easy for you to say. The inflation is going crazy. The gas price is $5 a gallon. Well, I don't think you've seen the highest gas prices yet. At what point do you quit trusting God with your blessing? You, <laughs> I'm just saying, at that, oh, that's it. Can't trust him anymore. Gas is $7 a gallon now. Somebody's got to say, you know what? He is my provider. Yes, and we also need to say as a church family, declare, I don't participate in inflation. I refuse to participate in it. Oh, yeah, in the natural, I live in the United States, and inflation is going crazy, and politics are going crazy. But here's what I do know. I know the truth. And the truth is, I've put Jesus first and I've proved it through my tithe. That's the purpose. By the way, that's the whole purpose of the tithe is to establish in my own heart. It's not because the church needs your money. No, it's the thing between you and God. The whole reason for it. And people ask me once in a while, do you have to talk about money? Because money is offensive to people. It is offensive. That's why Jesus talked about it. Matthew chapter six, he says, wherever your money goes first, there's your heart. And people say, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll trust God when all of my needs are met. See, the real faith comes into play when you act right and you act in a conduct of love when you don't feel it, when, it does, when you don't see it, when you can't taste it. I'm teaching you a principle here, how to get your healing, how to get your provision. You know, it's nothing for God to bring away. He's the way maker. He makes a way. And when you get to heaven and he puts that overcomer's crown on you, and he says, you were an overcomer. Well, you would have had to have had something to overcome. 
Pastor, all I want is gravy train. All I want is easy. I want the microwave. I don't want to be in the pan getting fried. No, no, no. It comes through trusting God when you, when you can't see it, when you don't feel it. Hey, I preached this not to bring condemnation. In Christ, there is no condemnation. I preach this to bring truth because the truth will set you free from the bondage, which is a lie. You know, I hate lies, don't you? Talking about relationship, when somebody lies to you, it is the foundation of the relationship. Because when you lie... From now forward, at least for a long while, there's a question mark behind everything else that's said. We have got to stop the lying to our own self. Because when you lie to yourself, it is very difficult to walk in faith. All right, let me finish that verse. I'm going to go back to the beginning of the Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17. It says, I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your heart, living within you as you trust him. May your roots go deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. Declare this with me. God loves me. He does love you. And may you, here's a good word, may you be able to feel and understand how long, how wide, how deep, and how high his love really is, and experience this love for yourself. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 8, verse 37 says it this way, and everything we have won more than a victory because Christ who loves us, and am sure that nothing can separate us from God's love. Life, death, not angels or spirits, nor the present, nor the future, and none of the powers above and none of the powers below, nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love for us in Christ our Lord. Let me just say, if you don't get any other message today, get this one, Christ loves you. He doesn't just like, I choose to love you because I have to. (laughs) Nobody's making God love you. God chooses to love you. He's obsessed with you. The Bible says that he's bent in his thoughts. What it means to be bent in his thoughts towards you, it's like an obsession. That's all he can think about. He's obsessed with thinking about, obsessed with expressing his love to you. And he wants you to open your heart, to make him feel at home in your heart. And he wants you to trust him as you trust him. And as you give your life unconditionally to him, he invades your heart and he makes you his own. And he wants you to feel special because you are. I want you to hear his spirit speaking to you. Hey, you're my favorite. And I don't know how he does it, but you really are his favorite. You really are. He's so obsessed with you. He's nuts about you. That's what bent means is I'm nuts about you. You would have to be nuts to love me. But nuts in a good way crazy bent. I'm just obsessed. Fill in the blank with your name. I'm obsessed with it. Amen. Did you know that you can't love? You can like people, okay, but you can't love without giving. For God so loved that he gave. And people say, I love God, but they don't give their time, their talent. They don't serve anywhere. Listen, let me just say to you, this is no condemnation on you if you haven't been serving or giving. 
But if you really want to open your heart up to feel God's love, start serving him. Get involved. The place to really serve it and play it out is in your local church. The place you ought to be giving is your own storehouse too. Amen. All right. Here's the ways. Here's some ways, some real quick ways. To love someone you don't like. (laughs) And that is, number one, experience God's love for yourself. The second thing is to forgive those who have hurt you. Colossians 3.13, forgive whoever's grievances for whatever grievances you may have against another. Forgive as the Lord forgives you. Do you know one of the best ways to fight the devil? Some of us are we're fighters. <laughs> yeah, we're a fight. I'm a fighter. I love, I don't like hockey as much as I used to because they've tampered down the fighting. I'm just, confession is good for the soul. I love the hockey brawls of the 70s and the 80s. That's just me. Pray for me if you don't like that. And you say, oh, I can't believe my pastor says he likes brawling. I know it's probably not the best, but man, a good hockey game is a good one because they had some roughness. And maybe I'm that way because I played hockey as a kid growing up. And when you get out there and you mix it up, you get in some scrimmages. Well, life is very much the same way. We want, we want, uh, there's another word for it, but they call it the sissification of hockey. You're using your imagination, aren't you? Yeah. You're glad you came to church today. (laughs) Need a confessional for me after it's over. But some of us want sissified Christianity where we don't have to fight the devil. Don't want to have to fight for our belief or fight for our marriages or fight for our church or fight for our relationship. Some of us don't want that. But let me just share this with you. Part of being an overcomer is you had to overcome some things. Amen. So I'll move on, but we want to fight the devil, and a lot of us want to fight issues, but what you're really fighting is not the issue. You're fighting for your faith. You're fighting the fight of faith. The next thing is think loving thoughts. This is a big one. This is huge, how to get how to get the feelings and the emotions to come back to a one time. It might be a parent with a child or child with a parent. It might be a husband with a wife, a wife with a husband. It could be any love situation. It's forgive. It first, experience God's love, number one. Number two is forgive others. And then number three, this is huge, start thinking right. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if all I meditate on and all I think on is the bad, the ugly, and how wrong this person is, how wrong, and all I think about is the bad stuff that happens, you'll nurture those feelings of unforgiveness, whether it might even be towards God. And so you have to be very intentional about the way and the how you think, the way, the way you think. And you refuse. Philippians says it this way in chapter two, verse four. Don't just think about your own affairs. Don't just think about those. But be interested in others and what they're doing. Your attitude should be the kind that was shown to us by Christ. One of the things I love about the way Christ is with us is he doesn't sit around and ponder how bad you are. He doesn't talk about how bad you are. You know what he talks about is how he talks about your future, your potential. He talks about your good qualities that he created you with. He talks about through the eyes of faith of how he made you to be and what he wants from you and how it's going to happen. He talks about those things. And when you are in the stress of a relationship, husband, wife, child, neighbors, coworkers, it's so easy to think about how bad they've been because you know they've been bad. (laughs) 
But it is time for us to nurture and meditate and begin to talk about and think about those thoughts intentionally. Think about the good things. Don't just think about your own affairs. Be interested in others. The fourth thing is this. Be, begin acting in a loving way. You act. Well, I can't act. Wouldn't I be, wouldn't I be a hypocrite? Wouldn't it be hypocritical of me to act in a way that I don't feel? That action is impure. Pastor, I don't feel love towards him or towards her. I'm not going to fake it. No, I'm just going to tell you, faith is Faith is acting when you don't feel it. How can you say that and then believe God for your healing? Because you're feeling the pain. If you're going to live by your feelings, feelings are fickle. They come and they go. Thank you for good feelings when they're there. But if they're not, I'm setting my eyes straight. I'm fixing my gaze. I'm going to do what's right. And if I go to the end of my life and I've continued to do what's right, I'll wear a crown of an overcomer and then I'll cast it at his feet when I'm in heaven. Well, let me just tell you something. You start acting it out when you don't feel it. It's not hypocrisy. It's not fake. It's not phony. It's easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. It is so much better and so much more biblical to act your way into. Here, here's the good news. Good news, good news, good news is that feelings will return when you start acting like it. It's easier to act your way into a feeling. Jesus gave us instruction in Luke chapter 6, verse 27, gave us four things to do. Jesus said, Love your enemies. Be good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistrust you. Love, do good, bless, and pray for. Did you hear the screaming in the room? People are so excited to apply that word. I can't wait to apply that word. We don't get excited about that. Forgive those, bless those, pray for those, talk good about them. Do you know the word bless means to speak? You've probably got some enemies in your life who hate you. Try this. Start speaking blessing. It doesn't feel good to do it. But you do it anyway, and then eventually it gets easier. You say, you know what, I, 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 I speak a blessing over him, over her, and I declare, I declare with my words, they are blessed. I declare what God declares about them. He loves them. Watch God favor you because you're doing, you're doing what the majority of people won't do. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, verse 4 says, love is kind. It is patient, never jealous or boastful, proud or rude. Love isn't selfish or quick-tempered. It doesn't keep a record of wrong. As others do. Love rejoices in the truth, but not in evil. Love is always supportive and loyal, hopeful and trusting. Love never fails. And then this one, expect the best from others. But he, I've been, we've been married for 40 years. He always lets me down. I'm just used to it now. I don't expect anything from him. I've given up. I just, I'm committed. I'm going to stay in the marriage. But see, love expects the best. Did you know that people will live up to what you expect? One of the best gifts you can give your children is to expect good from them and speak that expectation. You know what I love about you is you're a champion. I always, you might fall, but one of the things I love about you is you always get back up. I expect good from you. Don't you love it when people expect good things about you? 
And when they speak those good things and they say, you know, I know you're an overcomer. You know what I know about you? You are one of the wisest people that I've ever met. You're full of wisdom. They may have just done something very stupid. But you speak blessing over them. I speak and I declare over you, you're blessed. This is hard to do, isn't it? It's easy to talk about. It's easy for me to preach this. Living this, though, it's a little bit more difficult, everybody. So, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. If you love someone, and we do, you'll always believe in him and always expect the best of him. So let me end with this. Revelation chapter 2, how to rekindle lost love. You know, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, the revelator John, the apostle John, was alive and wrote this. He said, speaking a message on behalf of Christ, I do have something against you, and it is this. You don't have as much love as you used to. Let me say that again. You don't have as much love as you used to. Think about where you've fallen from and then turn back as you did at first. If you don't turn back, I'm going to come and take away your lampstand. But there is one thing that you're doing right. You hate what the Nicolaitans are doing, and so do I. Does everybody in here know what the Nicolaitans were doing? Probably none of us. The Nicolaitans were doing some things that were very offensive to the character and the nature of God. Number one, they were sacrificing their children. If they didn't want a child, they aborted the child after the child was born. They were, I know I'm preaching, I'm cutting through stuff. People leave churches over this type of content. But it is scripture. How many of you think God is for murder? He's not. And the Nicolaitans were very much into, this child is an inconvenient for me, therefore I'm not going to have this baby. I'll leave the rest of that alone. But not only were the Nicolaitans very pro-child killing, they were also Gnostic, quote, Christians. What does Gnostic mean? Gnostic means that they embraced false doctrine. How many of you know there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? There are other, quote, so-called Gospels out there that never made it in the Bible. And I even hear people today talk about there are other Gospels that never made it and they should be in the Bible. No, they shouldn't. I'm going to tell you why they shouldn't. Many of them are polluted with twisted and perverted. Like, here's some of the Gnostic gospel teachings. Some of the Gnostic gospels teach that Jesus married Mary Magdalene, that they were married and that they had had an affair and that they had children together. Jesus didn't have any children. His children are you, spiritual children. Some of them teach that that, and the list goes on and on. I'm not going to get into all the false beliefs and false doctrine. But what the Nicolaitans were doing, they were like, yeah, we're Christians, but we're open to our beliefs. We are all about including all beliefs. Now, I believe as a pastor, everybody's included in the love. But that does not put an okay and a stamp of approval on all behavior. See, real wisdom and real maturity comes from the difference between being able to say, I love you unconditionally, but I also speak the truth in love. That behavior is wrong. And a lot of modern Gnostic teaching today is to, is to be politically correct and for the church not to address. Yeah, you got to speak the truth and you've got to speak it in love. 
but you still have to speak it. There's a very famous preacher right now who's just, just coming out with a book about how wrong it is for the church to address political issues. And I want to tell you, it's wrong. I agree with this. It is wrong to address political issues from a position of hatred or condemnation. But it is not wrong for the church to speak what the scripture teaches in love, in love, okay? We got to do it. We got to do it. I want you to remember this. Christ loves you. He doesn't quit loving you because you've made mistakes or because you haven't been right. You're his favorite. And as you give your trust to him, he invades your life and he makes you what you're supposed to be. If you're not baptized...